Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Michael Thompson from Copperleaf Financial here in Vermont. And today I'm very excited um, to have my guest join, join me, Apollo Lepescu from Dimensional Funds. Uh, Apollo is um, nationally and internationally recognized as a, a speaker who's delivered hundreds of, of uh, seminars and sessions just like this across the country. Apollo is, is known as the Secretary of Explaining Stuff, which is exactly <laughs> why we're happy to have Apollo here today. Um, I also want to let you know that Apollo has been part of Dimensional Fund Advisors, which is our, our topic for today for over 17 years. He has a PhD in economics and finance from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and works from, uh, from Santa Monica, where he's joining us from today. So Apollo, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Michael, it's such a pleasure, and thanks for inviting me again. <laughs> and thanks to everyone for taking the time this afternoon to uh, uh, to attend. You're welcome, and and I look forward to it. I will remind everyone that um, we're recording this session. We will be posting um, a recording of it on our website, along with uh, other prior presentations um, in the past from the past. And um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. We encourage your questions. And you can enter questions by, um, by putting them in the, in the chat box down below um, or the, the Q&A. And we'll be going through questions um, as they arise, or we'll certainly have some time at the end to, to um, address questions as well. So thank you. So let's get started by talking about dimensional fund advisors. Dimensional funds is really the topic for today. And the reason that uh, we invited you, Apollo, for today is because Dimensional funds really represents the core of our portfolios. We've been committed to dimensional funds for a long time. We've, uh, we believe in the approach because it really represents what we think of as, and what we call evidence-based investing. But let's start off by, um, because dimensional isn't a household name, right. um, if you don't mind, give us uh, an overview and some background in dimensional and, and kind of what sets dimensional apart. Yeah, no, uh, it's it's it is indeed um, much better known in the institutional advisor world, right, in the retail world. And uh, uh, so, let me give you a quick overview of of, of this investment management firm called Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, Dimensional was set up uh, pretty much exactly forty years ago, back in nineteen eighty one. Uh, and uh, uh, today, uh, Dimensional uh, is one of the largest uh, uh, money managers in the world. Uh, we manage over $660 billion, um, and we have offices pretty much around the world, over 1,500 employees, uh, and we have dozens of, of, of mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, so we are a global company. We are a global investment firm, um, and, and we have been around for a long, long time. We have a very, very long track record with, with our funds. Um, and, uh, and in terms of what sets Dimensional apart, I think that's a really important question. If anybody was to look at the manager, um, there are two things that I, that, I, that, I, that I think are important to look at and what sets Dimensional apart. The first one is the business model and then the way that we work with the investment public and why is it that Dimensional might not be a household name. And the second is, what is the investment approach? What sets Dimensional apart from the, the typical mutual funds that exist out there? One you know, typically being called active management, stock picking, the other one called being, uh, being the index. So what sets the investment approach that Dimensional has uh, aside from everybody else? So if we're to start, Michael, on the first one, which is on the business model and what sets Dimensional apart from a business perspective, I think there are two or three things that I, I think are really important to acknowledge. The first one is that as Dimensional started for the first 10 years of its existence, uh, the funds were only available to large institutional investors. You have large pension funds, large endowments, uh, you know, uh, uh, sovereign funds, uh, and, and they, those are the only clients that Dimensional had. To participate into these funds. Mm -hmm. uh, but back in 1990, uh, there was a second uh, wave of, of clients, a uh, wave, a <laughs> second category of clients, uh, in, in which we looked at these institutions and realized that they, you know, they have consultants. Um, and when we realized that some advisors tend to be quite sophisticated and they do act more like consultants, they are much more sophisticated than the average 
uh, a broker, uh, and we decided to work with some of those advisors. Um, and, and, and the default has been not to allow access to these mutual funds to all advisors in the world, uh, but rather to say, if an advisor finds dimensional uh, and they want to trade, they would contact us uh, in, and we would have a mutual due diligence process. They understood what the funds do uh, and, 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 and you know, how they fit in their practice. And from our perspective, we wanted to make sure there's an alignment because what we found is that in the mutual fund industry, uh, it's really beneficial to a fund company to know who the clients are uh, because you can have better management of cash flows. And what does it mean? Uh, what it means is that, you know, you take a 2008 when everybody yep, was yep. panicking and they were selling their funds. Um, at that point, if you tell your mutual fund, I like my money back, the mutual fund has one day to give you the cash back. But in order to raise that cash, it has to start selling and sometimes rapid fire sales, whatever positions it might have in a mutual fund, stocks or bonds, to yes. generate cash to give it back to you. And in those situations, especially if everybody does the same thing, uh, then you really, the, the, the prices that you can get are really depressed. And at that point, you don't want to be on the sell side. <laughs> you perhaps want to be on the buy side. Uh, yeah. But by working with these large institutions who are disciplined and by finding this niche group of financial advisors who are sophisticated and they had a disciplined uh, approach to investing, uh, what we found is that it, it's ultimately beneficial to everybody uh, who invest in these funds. So right now, if you're an investor, regardless of the amount of money, and you say I'd like to buy dimensional funds, uh, you cannot buy dimensional mutual funds by logging into so whatever platform, uh, but rather the funds are only available still to these large institutional investors mm -hmm. and also through certain advisors like uh, Cooper Leaf, uh, who, are, uh, 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 who are actually uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, relationship with dimensional. And I want right. to clarify one more thing because we talk sure. about business model. Yep. The business model that, that, that you guys have at Cooper Leaf is that where you put the client first. In other words, you're not selling them product and get paid commission from selling that product. You right. work for your clients. Uh, and the only way that you get paid is, is because uh, the clients pay for your services. And Correct. we found that, that it, particularly back in the 1990s, when Dimensional started in the 1980s, there were a lot of financial advisors who are not really doing what's right for the client, but doing what's right for them because they were getting paid on commission. Right. And if you have two mutual funds and one pays you 5%, the other one pays you more, well, which one are you going to pitch? <laughs> right. So the idea was that, that we never wanted to incentivize advisors to use dimensional funds because we kicked that back some money. So right. in the entire history of dimensional funds, we have never paid an advisor to distribute our funds. It's yep. always been because they thought it's in the right, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the best interest of the client. Uh, and that's the fiduciary standard that you hear so much about. Dimensional advisors have had it forever. And when I say dimensional advisors, the only affiliation is that we've gone through this mutual due diligence and they're allowed to use the funds, but by no means there's a pressure to use dimensional, not at all. It's, right. a, it's basically, uh, if you think this is the right solution, great. You, you're not going to get paid from us. You're going to get paid from your clients. Might as well uh, give them the best shot. Uh, well, so I think that from a business perspective, these two ideas of always treating clients and not incentivizing advisors through commissions, mm -hmm. uh, and also by not offering the funds directly, because this way uh, you have a better control over the, uh, uh, the the cash flow management of the funds. Well, and and thank you for that explanation, Apollo. And at at Copperleaf, we really appreciate that alignment too, because. The core of the work that we do with our clients, of course, is planning. And, you know, we and we have always followed the fiduciary standard. We've always been uh, a completely fee only, fee only registered investment advisor. And we had to go through some due diligence yeah. to be approved by Dimensional. And we appreciated that because that alignment with from a philosophical standpoint and from a business model standpoint is so important to us because of what it means to our clients and our relationship to our clients. And, and we at Copperleaf really appreciate that alignment and it's, it's so important to us. So thank you, thank you very much for that. I, I wanna also- and By the way, on, Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna say one more thing on that note, sorry. Sure, to, sure. I thought when I started a Dimensional, I, I've been a Dimensional for 17 years. Yes. So when I, when, I, when I started, I thought, but of course, 
that's kind of how the world works. It, right. Of course, it, it, it can be any other way. Right. What I was amazed to find that even today, there are so many advisors who don't operate on the same standard. Yes. They're getting paid on commission. Uh, yes. The services that you're getting from Cooper Leaf is not there. It, it, it's not the norm. Yeah. What you have there is something that is way above the rest of the industry. You'd yeah. be amazed how how much uh, uh, how many assets are still managed in the in the traditional conventional way of a brokerage commission and so forth. I have been amazed, and and, and it blew my mind because. I do work in this incredibly re rewarding <laughs> network of advisors who are yes. elite, uh, but that's not the norm. And I don't know that clients always get the feel, well, aren't all advisors the same? Not at all. I, I have seen enough in my life, I can tell you, there are very few advisors like Cooper Leaf out there. It's, it's really hard for consumers to, to really um, sort things out and to really understand that truth and the reality of how different business models operate, it's, it's really unfortunate. The, and the other thing is where it goes to philosophy, I think that's important too. And again, I said in the beginning that at Copperleaf, we think of our approach as evidence-based. And I know that that's a really important and there's a me that means something to dimensional as well. So right. can you talk a little bit about um, how Dimensional's approach to investing may be different from the rest of the world. And I think about that in a couple of ways. For example, um, uh, I, you know, I think about um, asset allocation, which is really important to us, of course, as planners. So tell us a little bit about what evidence-based yes. means to Dimensional. Yeah. And first of all, by the way, I think I just said Cooper Leaf instead of Copper Leaf. <laughs> so I just realized that I had the wrong. It's, it's, it's okay. You talk. You talk to a lot of people. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. It's okay. <laughs> Carry on. Um, so you know, when we talk about the investment philosophy, I think that that the first thing that I would note is that as Dimensional was formed forty years ago, uh, the idea, at, at the core idea. Uh, back then was to try to take uh, a, a scientific approach to investing. And if you really try to do a scientific approach, probably the best way to go is to actually involve the academic, uh, the academics who produce this research, uh, because yeah. everything that is academic, it tends to be incredibly data driven, incredibly robust, and it's being, you know, vetted, not just by a peer, and not just by one individual, but peers all around the world. So this idea yeah. of using academic research research has been uh, absolutely crucial from day one. In mm -hmm. fact, the founders of Dimensional, uh, when, they, when they started and they, and they saw some research that I'll talk about in a minute, when they saw some research, the first thing they did is they went to the University of Chicago, and they were graduates of the University of Chicago, and mm -hmm. they went to the economics department, which had several Nobel winners, and they were actually Nobel winners at the time, they got it later, but they went to them and they said, listen, we want to start this and we want you to make sure that, that uh, everything we do is in line with the top-notch scientific research, but also that the way we go about doing the research and implementing uh, is, is incredibly robust. Mm -hmm. uh, so from day one, Dimensional had probably the strongest academic affiliation of any mutual fund out there, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, on the investment committee over the years, we have had three or four Nobel Prize winners who ha have been there on an investment committee to make sure that everything we do is, uh, is robust. Um, and I happen to have a PhD. And I had to defend my PhD in front of my committee uh, at UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And what's remarkable, I, I was talking when I first started with uh, one of the, uh, the, the heads of research uh, who was telling me, listen, if you thought it's intimidating to go and defend your dissertation in front of your committee, imagine that you're going in front of three or four Nobel winners, some of the top academic minds, and you're trying to uh, present to them an idea on, on something that you might want to try to explore into a fund. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the level mm -hmm. of, of rigor that you have to put out there is absolutely amazing. So yeah. it is a very academic, uh, and what I mean by data-driven and really the roots is in science and academic research. Uh, and, uh, and that's kind of the, the fundamental. And one of the primary uh, uh, um, uh, theories that, that we use is this idea that, that everything evolves. 
We know there's yeah. evolution in everything. And, yeah. and one of the most powerful notions in the evolution of finance um, is this idea that as markets evolve, uh, information trend, it tends to move at a different pace. And mm -hmm. there was a time when, you know, by the way, Michael, this is just a little, you know, uh, trivia for everybody on the call. The very mm -hmm. first uh, uh, stock in the modern sense of the world uh, mm -hmm. was the Dutch East India Company in oh, yeah. 1602, 1602, over 400 years ago. Yep. Uh, that's, that's exactly the basis of modern stock investing. Yep. And yep. What, the, what people found is that they were allowed to trade these their shares of ownership. And the crucial, crucial uh, 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 insight there was having information. If you mm -hmm. had information about a ship and how it you know, traveled to the Indies and came back or maybe right. not come back, that would give you a competitive advantage in trading the stocks. And yes. this idea of information and competitive advantage has been huge to the stock market. And back mm -hmm. in those days, it might have taken weeks, if not months, for information to get to investors. Uh, mm -hmm. But over the course of time, what's been happening is that the information has gotten to, investor, uh, to investors quicker and quicker. It went from weeks to days uh, to hours, uh, became minutes at some point. Uh, and, and over the past you know, 50 to 70 years, what we've seen is that it's an increasing speed uh, at which information gets to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, the reason that's important is that the old way of investing money, uh, that's, that's you know, going back to you know, 100 years ago, was this idea that, that in order to be a successful investor, uh, what you ought to do is let's just consider this, uh, this square to be the, the entire stock market. A yes. successful investor would analyze companies, look at the data, uh, and, and look at everything about a company, uh, and then just simply cherry pick a, a handful of these stocks. Uh, and and, and uh, by having that information, either because you get it faster than other people, you have better information, or you can process it in a superior way, all of this would give an investor a competitive edge. And I would say that that was a state of the art up, about, up until about 50 years ago. But then something happened. Academic research started looking and saying, well, when you do this, how successful uh, uh, are these folks? Uh, because the theory is kind of putting out there that when, when information is available to investors, markets tend to do a pretty good job of taking this information and putting it into prices fairly quickly. And right. what the evidence showed is that these managers uh, don't actually have a way of outperforming the market consistently. In fact, in research that was done, uh, and it's published on our website, what you see is that uh, about 15% or so over 20 years of managers who attempt to beat the market by picking stocks are actually successful, meaning that- yeah. Over 80% of them underperform. So to me, right. this idea that, that markets are incredibly powerful and what they do, what they do is, is really incorporate all this information quickly. Um, and if you're an investment manager, you could try to pick some stocks. In my view, uh, in the view that we have at Dimensional, because markets are so competitive, because information travels so fast, mm -hmm. it, it's not really possible today to consistently outsmart everybody else in the market. There are too many opinions, too much information. And just so you have a sense, Michael, mm -hmm. there are more professionally managed mutual funds in the U.S. than mm -hmm. actual stocks trading on the market. Wow, that's it's amazing. So that's amazing. So, so one of the things that we believe is that rather than putting our own opinion ahead of everybody else, it is more powerful to look at the markets as a whole and say, the price that we see right now, I have no idea if it's right or wrong, but it is probably the fairest estimate out there of everything that we know about that company. So rather than out guessing the market, let's just start with the premise that this particular uh, stock is at a price that's fair. And to kind of give you that, you know, maybe one day when I come to Vermont, we'll do this. But um, yeah. I, I used to do this experiment pretty much all over the world. When I would take mm -hmm. a jar of jelly beans, oh, it yeah. was the Costco jelly bellies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, um, I would ask uh, uh, at a client event, there were like 50 people, or whatever number of folks, to sure. write down on a piece of paper uh, how many jelly beans they thought would be in the jar. And yeah, I've yeah. done this over and over. The range is usually 500 to 5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then I asked the advisor to tabulate the results and give me the average. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that, that, that the actual number is in the neighborhood of about 
1800 or so, mm -hmm. um, the invariably, the average of all entries, which ranged from 500 to 5000, the average was always within about 5% of the actual number over wow. and over again. Wow. NPR, NPR just did a, 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 well, not just did, they did a, a couple of years ago, an experiment when they put a picture of a cow and they asked people to uh, to go online and and uh, and, and guess the, the weight of the cow. And they're okay. experts and non-experts. Uh, it turns out that, that the average of the 17,000 entries <laughs> was, uh, uh, was, was within two or 3% of the actual weight of the cow. Wow, isn't that amazing? Yeah, so it's this idea that there are different opinions out there, um, and uh, uh, and 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 you know yours just happens to be one of the many. But putting all these together tends to be a better way to look at the world, and I think it's fundamental because what we're saying, but that by doing this, picking stocks and looking at individual companies, it is not state of the art. It's not a data driven approach to investing. Yeah. So rather, what the academics have done has have, have, have kind of thought of a different way of doing it. Instead yeah. of looking at it, these individual companies, what Dimensional has been doing is taking these companies and say there might be fine to have, but try to understand their behavior, not in isolation, but mm -hmm. as part of a much larger group of stocks, uh, what's called asset class or factor investing. Oh, and I think that lies, the, that, that is a fundamental difference in difference in research that Dimensional has been doing. It's hmm. not the individual company, but the company is part of a larger group. Uh, so, and so, so uh, Paulo, let me stop you for a second. Let's see if I can interpret what you, what you just said a little bit. So it sounds like what you're saying is that it used to be a long time ago that if I was a, a stock picker, there might be a way for me to get an edge, to get a, be, a piece of information that maybe nobody else had or very few people had. And by doing that, I might be, be able to get myself an advantage in terms of the price of the, of the stock and whether it was a good time to buy it or sell it. But yep. over time, through technology and through maybe even volume, it yep. sounds to me like the, the stock market is almost like a giant computer and every day, so many transactions. And when we look at those averages that you just talked about, the way those things work, that it's really hard for anybody to, to find an edge and that the, the market fairly prices things just because of the, the sheer volume and, and the volume of information, the volume of trades and the speed with which information moves. And so, Absolutely. And, and so, and so what Dimensional does is thinks about the behavior of certain types of companies or certain types of stocks as a preferable way to, to kind of think about um, the behavior of, of certain stocks rather than trying to find an edge with an individual company. And, but that makes me think of one thing, which I sometimes hear from, from clients. And what I often say to clients to begin with, which is rather than trying to speculate and trying to guess winners and losers or when's the right time to buy or sell a stock, it wouldn't we rather own the, own the market? It's, I'd rather own the market. So that makes me think of what we think of as indexing or sometimes clients talk to me about indexes, right? Yep. But I, I think there's a, something a little bit different in how dimensional approaches things. And maybe you are starting to get at that, but what is the difference between how dimensional thinks about things and approaches investing than, than sort of an index and, 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 and how is that different? Yep. So let's talk about what is an index, first of all. Because oh, good question. Yeah. So what an index uh, is, is, is simply um, a, a list of stocks. And, and the very first popular index, we all know about the Dow Jones. Mm -hmm. It was created back in the 1890s by Charles Dow, because what he wanted to know is not how any one company did in terms of performance, but it's a, well, a broader measure. Uh, and back in those days, a broader measure was 12 companies. And, and I thought, why 12 and not more? And, and one simple answer came to my <laughs> back in those days there was no computer or calculator and you had to do everything by hand so imagine yeah. adding up the price and dividing so it was <laughs> cumbersome so like he chose 12 eventually got to 30 yeah, uh, yeah. but the idea is that you put together a list and that list gives you a sense of how a broader measure uh, uh, behaves rather than just each individual company and then you can mm -hmm. compare an individual company with the market as a whole 
Right. And over time, uh, it went from just the Dow Jones. And, and, and uh, later on in the 1920s, uh, there were two companies, Standard Statistics and, and Poor's Publishing, and they mm-hmm. merged, forming Standard & Poor's. Uh, right. And that has its own list. Uh, and there are another list that were created later on. There is one created by NASDAQ that is just all the companies that trade on that particular exchange. You have a list created by Morgan Stanley. It's called MSCI. But all of these are lists that were created initially to really um, uh, provide a yardstick to investors. How did the market do? And they're all a little different, but b- for the purpose of this, let's just consider this, that they're a list created by these committees. Now, when these committees create the list, there was no investment product. They just wanted to create the list so we have something to yardstick again, to have a benchmark, as we call yes. it. Now, over the years, particularly as this research came along, and this is where the founders of Dimensional came along, what they realized is the performance of the list, the market as a whole, all these stocks together, it tends to do better than the majority of the managers. So the natural you know, next thing to do is like, well, if I have a list of stocks that tends to outperform the majority of the managers, why don't we create a mutual fund or an investment fund that replicates that list? So what an index fund does, it basically in the context of what I just showed here, it would look at an entire basket of stocks created through a list. uh, And then the index would just simply go to that provider of the list, whoever it might be, Dow Jones, S&P, Standard & Poor's, it could be MSCI, Russell, they're all these providers. Mm -hmm. But a mutual fund goes to this provider and says, okay, okay, can you please license me this list? Allow me to to use this list. And I will create a mutual fund called an index fund that perfectly replicates the list at all times. Every day, it would have the same companies, the same stocks or the same percentage. um, and, And our job is to absolutely mimic the list and do nothing else. Right. And again, it's a superior way in a way because it's it's more diversified. It tends to be more tax efficient. It beats a lot of the other folks uh, who are picking stocks. The problem with an index fund is that the um, the, the, the the mutual fund uh, they actually do not control at all the stocks that go on the list. It's the committee that controls it. So if the committee basically says, okay, well, I'm going to license you the list, but I might license it to twenty other mutual fund managers, none of these mutual fund managers that have that list as an index fund, none of them have any control over the stocks that go into their fund. Uh, right. So if, 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 a, uh, the, if the, the provider of the list, let's say the SMP, removes a stock from the list, on the day that's removed, every single index fund manager in the world that, that mimics that list, they have to sell that stock exactly oh my on that day. That so must imagine, be very challenging. Exactly. Imagine, or, or it could be the, the, the vice versa. If yeah. a stock is added to the list, everybody has to buy it and add it on that exact day. Hmm. And it just happened not too long ago with Tesla. Tesla went uh, uh, it, it, you know, into the S&P 500 at the end of last year. And on the day uh, that, that it was added, you can see that there was a price pop because everybody who had followed the list of the S&P, they had to buy Tesla on that day. That's called reconstitution effect. It's well documented. And basically mm-hmm. what you're doing is you're buying at a high point. And as an investor, you don't want to buy high. You want to buy no. low and sell right. high. But in this case, the index has no choice because you're following that. So I just wanted to say that index is not a bad idea, but -hmm. you are leaving money on the table because you really don't have uh, control over the stocks of your in in your own fund. What Dimensional is trying to do is trying to improve and go beyond indexing, even though you're still trying to cover an asset class. And the way that we try to do it is in I would just kind of organize them into three different uh, uh, buckets. The first one is the list itself. What we're trying to do is create a different list than an index. So our lists are not exactly the same as an index. So how are they different? Um, I'll I'll give you the the first distinction that that I think it's really important. Uh, Over the years, even as we know that that the market does a good job incorporating this information and the prices are fair, but it doesn't mean that as an investor, you should expect all the stocks to grow at the same rate. 
Obviously, there's some stocks that might grow at a different rate than another. Um, in, in technical jargon, it's called expected returns. So yes. not all stocks have the same expected returns to investors looking ahead. Uh, and what uh, academic research uh, found way back in the 19, uh, well, late 70s, early 80s, is that you can organize the stock market. And once again, let's look at the square as being the stock market. And in, instead of looking at sectors, which doesn't really have the economic intuition or the data behind it, what, what we found is that, that, and what academic research found, is that the, there are some large companies, which you see in the Dow Jones and the S&P 500, which again, are just representative of large companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's one group of stocks, but there is a second group of stocks that is not part of the S&P uh, or the Dow Jones, and those are smaller companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same way that we know there's a, <laughs> uh, a Pfizer vaccine, there is a Moderna. Moderna is not in the S&P. Uh, there is a McDonald's, but there's also a Shake Shack. Uh, yeah. so they're both publicly traded companies. So it turns out there are tons of companies that are not in the S&P, roughly about 2,000. And what the academic research found is that these companies, they do have a, a you know potentially more room to grow. I mean, it's easier for me to see Shake Shack doubling in size rather than McDonald's. But right. they also carry more uncertainty, and they're you know in the world riskier. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 from an investor and and from an economic perspective, you know risk and return are related. So riskier mm -hmm. companies ought to pay investors more because if McDonald's and Shake Shack give me the exact same growth on my money. Mm -hmm. I'll just give my money to McDonald's. And right. what we found, um, and we have this book called The Matrix Book. It's a phenomenal book, and you're very. Oh, I familiar. love that book. Uh, what we found is that if you go back to the, the first time we have data uh, and you look in the S&P and you look at a growth of a dollar, a, a growth of a dollar would have been roughly about 10,000 bucks or so. Uh, so it's a pretty significant growth in, in $1 in my dad's lifetime, which he'll be 95 soon enough. Mm -hmm. But the same dollar over the same time period in small companies would have been in the order of about 35,000 bucks. Wow. So significantly greater growth in small company stocks rather than the large. So, so hold on, let me see, make sure I understand what you're saying. So what you're saying is a dollar invested in 1926 in the S&P 500 would have grown to 10,000, but mm -hmm. over the same period of time, that dollar in small companies would have grown to 35,000. Is that what you're saying? Exactly right. And, and if you look at the dimensional uh, uh, matrix book, and it is, this is a dimensional small cap index, when you look at that in, in, in that book, what you see is exactly that, that over the long run, the same dollar over the same time period would have grown significantly more in small, but it's not surprising. I expect mm -hmm. that. I expect yes. that. It's it's a risk return story. It's also intuitive. Yep. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, an investor needs to deploy capital. Well, I, you know, if I don't get paid more <laughs> into something riskier, why take the chance? Why exactly pay? makes sense. So, so part of what we did back in 1981 was to offer investors exposure to these small companies uh, that at the time nobody was providing exposure to. So, so that's kind of what we did way back in the uh, way back in the day. Uh, so that was that was the first line of research that that you know you look and you differentiate based on large and uh, uh, and small, and that's the first uh, you know way to delineate and, and distinguish between uh, between companies. So. So are you are you saying let me see if, again if i can interpret yeah. it sounds like what you're saying is dimensional learned from the academic research that small companies outperformed and gathered this data and said let's see if we can put together a fund that's not focused on on the s p 500 or other indexes but let's put together a fund that tries to capture that extra return by investing in small companies yeah. Um, but not just a, 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 a bunch of single, a discrete group of small companies, but really a broad yeah. basket of small companies. Is that right? And, and it sounds Absolutely. like that was, that was a pretty unique thing to do. Absolutely. We're the first company to ever, to ever do that. Um, and in fact, what's interesting <laughs> is that this, this, when you mentioned is not one, but it's, it's, a, it's a larger group. Um, to me, I've always thought of it in terms of, um, in terms of uh, fishing, I'm not a great, I mean, like I'm not even fishing, but, but think about, you know, swimming in the ocean and, and you swim and at some point you look down and you have the goggles on and you see a school of fish. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and in one, one instance, you can try to say, well, you know, should I be, um, should I be, uh, uh, you know, trying to predict how each individual fish should move, uh, <laughs> or should I be trying to understand the behavior of the entire school of fish? Right. So what we're saying is like, no, try to understand the behavior of the entire school of fish. There's a lot more precision there when I'm trying to predict which ones will thrive and which ones will die. Uh, but, but not all fish are the same. So you have to also now categorize them uh, and you have to do it on the, on the right basis. But what, we're, what we have been suggesting to investors is that uh, you have to be very purposeful uh, and you have to typically, I mean, I, I ideally have an advisor uh, because it, it, you know, we're not suggesting that everybody should just take all the money and pile them into a small company. There has right. to be a balance there. It's just to what degree are you willing to emphasize maybe small companies in search for a higher potential for growth. Mm -hmm. but by the way, it, it, the small is not the only category that, that, that really made a difference for, uh, in the academic research because in the 1990s, uh, you know, the realization was that not all large companies are the same, not all small the same. Uh -huh. And what matters too is the price at which you buy uh, a stock. And, and the price, you have to make it relative to an accounting fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can use cash flows or book value, we use book value. And the companies that have a relatively low price for their accounting fundamental, they're called value stocks. And historically, they have outperformed the more expensive counterparts called growth. Hmm. Uh, so now we know that not only small tends to outperform large over the long run, but also value uh, uh, beats growth. And hmm. knowing that, obviously, the one asset class that would have both uh, uh, you know, both of these uh, small and value uh, would give investors probably the biggest bang for the buck over the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the dimensional matrix book for that, for the dimensional small value index, what you see is that the, the same dollar over the same time frame uh, grows to over ninety thousand dollars. Oh my God! Uh, so it's it, once again significantly greater potential for growth uh, for an investor, uh, and 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 I think this is a great primer. Because what it tells you is that, you know, along with an advisor, you can be very purposeful in the way that you decide how much do I want to hold in large companies, the Apples, the Googles, uh, the Pfizer's versus in the smaller companies like the Moderna and the Shake Shacks. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and how much do I want to go towards value versus growth? And, and the more you, you know, you feel like, hey, it's worth for me to emphasize small companies and value stocks. Well, the more you give yourself a chance to earn higher uh, expected uh, uh, returns. And that's not only in the U.S., it also applies in international developed markets. Uh, it also applies in emerging markets. So it's a really a, a global way of thinking about allocating um, your assets in the stock market. Uh, and that's, that's, I think it's, 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 a, um, it's something that, that uh, uh, it's very, very few individual investors can successfully do without an advisor. And even within the advisor community, uh, I find that, that uh, you know, not every advisor, in fact, most advisors don't necessarily apply this. They're still stuck in the old way, which is, well, let's go find what stock's gonna do well this month or this year, which is, again, not state of the art. And, and this makes me wonder, Apollo, if, if there must, m might be something in Dimensional's name actually that relates to this. Is this some, somehow related to um, yeah. the dimensions of return? Is that, tell exactly me a little bit right. about that. Exactly, and that's exactly what we call them. They're, 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 they're this, we call them in the technical jargon, dimensions of expected returns. Ah. So you can create these dimensions and then it can be very purposeful in the way that you get exposure to them as an investor. And that's exactly right. It's there are dimensions of expected returns. And, and what's interesting, it's not just in the US, it's around the world and you can do exactly the same thing. So there are dimensions, not just in terms of these characteristics, but also a global perspective to, uh, 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 to investing. Yeah. And, and so we've been talking about stocks, about equities. Um, does the same thing apply to bonds? And, and how, how should we think about bonds? How does Dimensional yeah. think about bonds? And Michael, before we move to bonds, uh, sure. absolutely, I, I do want to make one remark. And, and this yeah. is something that, that, you know, as I was talking to one of my, you know, kids not too long ago, and we're trying to, we're, we have a little session on, on education around stocks. And, you know, every single, there were a group of five kids and, and, and every single one of them uh, kind of raised their hand at the same time and, and asked the same question. What do you think it was? 
Uh, well, I guess the obvious question for me is why wouldn't I put all my money in that little exactly box? Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Why not right. put all the money in small value? Right. What's the catch? What's the risk? Right. Um, it, it is important for people to understand what is the catch and what is the risk there. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's fascinating to me is that the risk of the strategy is not necessarily that you, you know you might stand to lose a lot more money than you would in large company or buying the S and P. Uh, there's a different type of risk and it's much more of a behavioral risk mm. when people see these numbers their first thought is like boy small is going to be large value is going to crush growth of course i want to be in those parts of the market mm -hmm. uh, but all this because it's a data driven it's an and it's an evidence-based approach it is not about certainty or guarantees it's much mm -hmm. more about understanding your odds statistics and probabilities. That's what it is. It's, it's understanding the odds. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way that, Michael, if, if, if I start working out and eat healthier, that doesn't guarantee me a longer lasting, healthier life. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, I, you know, you look at Cliff Richards or, or all these folks who keep smoking and doing whatever they do up in the right. 80s and 90s. And, well, look, look, that guy's alive. Right. Uh, yes, but for every one of those, there are 20 who don't make it. So statistically, right. you're still better off quitting smoking and, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and not eating those, you know, those donuts every day. Um, right. But but the, the idea is that in the in, in this in this part of the um, investing, it's kind of the same. Uh, you have to be aware that the risk here is about expectations and managing your expectations. Yes. Uh, if you look at value outperforming growth, for example, and you say on a one-year basis, how often do I see that? Well, on a one-year basis, roughly about 59% of the time, what you see is that value uh, beats growth historically um, over one year. So what it also means, the flip side of saying that is that four in 10 years is not there. Right. And that is not trivial. Yeah, it's not trivial, no. In 10 years, you say, well, you know what, Michael, that bull guy said that value is going to outperform and, and, and it didn't. Well, right. again, one, uh, four in 10 years, it doesn't happen. Even yep, if you yep. give it five years and now you go to five years, what you see is that now it becomes 72% of the time. So the odds get better. Mm -hmm. But even now, more than one in four periods of five years, it, you're not going to see the results that, that, that we expect. And it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and even if you look at 10 years, it becomes roughly about one in five years, one in five, uh, 10 year periods, not five years, one in five, 10 year periods, uh, mm -hmm. you're not going to necessarily see the results that you expect. In other words, a big part of the system to work is to have an advisor who can coach clients through periods when value might not outperform. And there might just be like, you know, I'm done with this. I've given them one year, two years, five years. I'm done with this. Yep. You know, if you saw these odds, if you walk into a table in Vegas and you saw these odds, you tell me, <laughs> what would you, what would you invest? How would you think about the odds? Um, you know, I, I would say that any any table you walk into Vegas, if you saw these odds, you're like, I'll go with that. <laughs> right, right, right. It doesn't right. mean that you're going to win every time, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't diversify. So I think diversification and discipline are the absolutely two important ingredients, uh, without which, um, you know, you, you can't really reap these benefits, and that's why the advisor becomes so crucial to the process. That's why uh, most in individual investors don't do this is because they don't have a good advisor who understands the system. So, yeah, I do want to make that point because it's not just about look how bright the sun is, but also, you know, put some sunglasses on because you, you need to be careful. It's a really good point. And it reminds me of a, of a couple of things before we touch on bonds, which is the, the reason that we, ha we have to have some balance. And so what we think of when we're working with clients and their portfolios is we're tilting towards these factors, towards these dimensions of potential higher return. We're not going all in. We're tilting towards, towards those factors so that we can hope to pick up that additional return over time. But you've got to be there. You've yep. got to participate and you've got to be invested when those show up. Because in my experience, they don't always show up. And yep. sometimes they show up unexpectedly. Yep. So it's sort of somebody, uh, somebody once called it like hunting. You've, you've got to be, you got to be out there waiting when the deer shows up. Otherwise, um, yeah. you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get it. So I think those, those are important things. So thanks for reminding us of, uh, of those pieces too. 
Um, well, would, what, what about bonds? Is there, is there, does Dimensional um, um, invest using, using bonds yeah. and using fixed income? And, and what, do we, what do we know about that? So when we look at bonds, um, you know, the first thing is to, to understand that, that there are very different um, classes of investment because stocks are about buying ownership. You buy, buy ownership into a company and the value of the ownership depends on the profits and profits fluctuate. And so does the stock market. Uh, so, you know, stocks are about ownership uh, that they grow a lot because that, you know, when companies do well, you partake, but there's it's a lot of fluctuation. You have no idea what you're going to get from one year to another. Mm -hmm. Bonds, on the other hand, are about lending. What you're doing is you're lending your money to corporations and governments. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a contract in place that specifies the interest rate that you will receive uh, and for how long. And at the back end, you get your money back. So in that respect, the lending portion tends to give investors uh, a little bit more clarity onto what they will get because it's again it's an interest rate that is spelled out into a contract um, but these two different types of investments uh, that do want to play around really nicely with each other uh, but they are they are different uh, and and the first thing they're different is is just to see uh, if you look at the uh, the s p 500 uh, you know we kind of talked about over the long run it has earned about nine ten percent return annualized per year to investors right uh, but from year to year it's very very choppy uh, but it's also been incredibly rewarding with one dollar over the long run uh, growing to about ten thousand again looking at the uh, the matrix book now now, uh, the thing is that that if you had invested the same uh, uh, money into, uh, let's say, uh, bonds issued by the U.S. government uh, over 30 days, after 30 days, you get your money back plus interest. Those are called yep. the 30-day treasury bills. When you look in the matrix book, what you see is that over the long run, uh, investing in these bonds never resulted in a negative calendar outcome. So in other oh, words, yeah. you haven't opened the end, the, your statement at the end of one year and say, boy, you know, I've lost, uh, I've lost money. So it's always been, you know, non-negative. Um, and what's also fascinating about these bonds is that uh, they have earned over the long run uh, uh, above inflation. The, the uh, long-term annualized return of, of, of these 30-day treasury bills have been in the order of about three, four percent per year. Mm -hmm. uh, so for an investor, it's incredibly important to have the right balance between stocks, which give you growth, uh, uh, and bonds. Uh, and for some folks, and this is a very personalized decision, this is what one of the most important decisions that has to be based on a plan uh, that, yeah, yeah. that, um, uh, that 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 uh, Copper Leaf and the team there, Michael, can provide to you. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a very big difference, very big difference, because particularly these bonds issued by the U.S. government, very credit worthy, they, they tend to, uh, um, they tend to, you look like it's three, four percent, it can't be that bad. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the same dollar growth over the same time period in these treasury bills, what you see is that instead of you know, uh, growing a nine, 10% and going to 10,000 bucks, the same dollar grows to 22 bucks. Not missing okay. any zeros, not missing wow. any zeros. It's a huge difference between stocks and bonds. So you want to, uh, you know, consider the bonds uh, as, 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 as kind of like a, a, a ballast to your portfolio. If you go yeah. sailing, you put the sail up, it's going to go fast, but toss you all over the place. Bonds are more like the ballast. They're designed to slow you down, but they give you the desired stability. Uh, so, so they have to work one another and, you know, how much balance do you want to put? That's a decision that, that you and, uh, the team, uh, uh, and, and Michael, uh, yep. uh decide on it based on the plan. Well, I, I it, mentioned this because it's so important. Yes, Mike. It's, it's so important. And, and, you know, what we tell clients, Apollo is part of our planning work is helping each client develop an investment policy for them. And what I always tell them is we need to know, I invite clients to think about their money as though they're the fiduciary of their pension fund. Yep. And it's important for them to understand how hard does that pension fund need to work on average over time in order for them to accomplish their, their goal. And maybe that's retirement, maybe there are a bunch of goals, but that's just math. We can determine how hard the money needs to go to stay ahead of inflation, yep. stay ahead of taxes, and provide them with the with the, the 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 capital that they need over the rest of their lives, and then we can design an investment policy using the math of how hard we we the the expected return of bonds and the expected return of stocks and break it down a little bit further to design an investment policy that's aimed at 
that return that the client needs to achieve their objective. And that's really the part of the planning process and part of helping the client develop a personalized investment policy that's exactly laser focused on, on that. So you're right, it's that balance of how much ballast do we need and how much growth do we need to achieve the right long-term objective for each client. So thank you for, for going through that, that's important. Yeah. And this is no way to do it without a, without a plan, no way to do it. Um, otherwise you're just simply guessing and uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's not really robust. So but, I, know, want to, I yeah. want to shift gears a little bit, if you don't mind, if we can yes. kind of move off of this topic a little bit, because I know that Dimensional recently has, has launched some exchange traded funds. Yes. Um, we call them ETFs. And I don't know if a lot of clients know what that really means, although we're using them in our portfolios now. So hopefully <laughs> some do. Um, but, but what's that all about? Why is, why is Dimensional going down this path? And, and is there a, a benefit to exchange traded funds versus mutual funds? And, and how, how do you think about that? Yeah. So it, it's, um, ETFs uh, have got a lot of attention and, and uh, uh, recently we have actually um, uh, made some significant changes um, to some mutual funds and actually convert them into ETFs. So let's, let's explain first what's the idea of a mutual fund versus ETF. Yes. It all has to do with the way that you package something. So it doesn't have to do with the content itself, the, the, what, what are you holding, the stock positions or the bond position, whatever. It, that, that's not the issue. The issue is the wrapper. Um, and, and the way that I thought in my mind is that if you look at a, a Harry Potter Potter book uh, and, and, and you say, okay, I want to get a Harry Potter book. Well, there is a, um, a paperback and there is a hard cover. There are two mm. different ways to wrap the exactly the same content. The content is identical hopefully, <laughs> but the content's identical. It's the wrapper that, that, that makes the difference. Um, and, and each one of these two, the mutual funds and ETFs, they have certain benefits to investors. And it re re really depends on, on your preference. Um, I, I really believe that, that ultimately it boils down to one thing. It, the, the, there is minimal difference. Cost, it's not, it's, they're the same. So when it comes to cost, when it comes to you know, uh, diversification, when it comes to pretty much being identical, but there's one distinguishing feature that I think uh, has been important to uh, investors and, and, and that's where you can choose between the ETFs and the, and the mutual funds. Uh, not, no, not saying that's what, right or wrong. It's not about when you trade them. I don't think that they're really meaningful for a long-term investor. I think the most meaningful thing for, for a client is this. In the case of a mutual fund, at the end of each year, uh, there are some gains that the fund that realized. So, for example, if if you if the if a, if a, if the fund the mutual fund had a stock that that you know we bought for let's like, say twenty dollars and then we sold for thirty dollars during that year, there will be a ten dollar uh, uh, a gain. Uh, it's called capital gain, uh, and that will be distributed to investors at the end of the year. And at the end of the year, you would have to pay taxes on that gain, and you're done. You don't have to pay taxes anymore on that gain. So you pay at the end of the year uh, and. And, uh, and it, it, along the way, as you hold a mutual fund, you basically pay these, these capital gains. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we noticed over the years is that, that uh, some investors uh, have a preference of not just only paying them along the way, but what if you can defer these capital gains? And in, instead of paying them you know, each year, you pay them when you actually sell. Uh, so the big difference between, in my view, between mutual funds and ETFs is giving investors and advisors a choice. Mm -hmm. If you want a mutual fund, you pay the, the, the taxes along the way and your tax bill at the end won't be that big. If mm -hmm. you don't want to pay along the way, then you can use an ETF and on the capital gains, uh, you know, you don't pay along the way, but there's a bigger tax bill at the end. So which one is your preference? Do you want to pay along the way or do you pay at the end? And, you know, there are some investors that, that, that who really look and say, you know, I don't know what the tax rates are going to be in the future. They could be higher. I'm okay paying along the way and not having the big tax bill at the end. Mm -hmm. Others are saying, you know, I'm actually, I don't want to pay right now and I'll just take my chances to see what happens at the end. Uh, particularly since the ETFs also allow you to, you know, because you're not paying taxes, it grows, you have, you know, interest on the money that you don't pay to the government. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of personal preference in my view of when do you want to pay the taxes? ETFs mm -hmm. do not avoid taxes. They just simply push them back. And, yep. and that's the question for an investor. Do you want to pay along the way? Or do you pay at the back end? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that that everybody is there. There are so many people with different preferences, 
Um, and and in, in certain uh, uh, situations, like if you have accounts that are called qualified, when you know retirement accounts, so you don't pay taxes along the way. It's it's really at that point it becomes absolutely irrelevant, absolutely mm-hmm. irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's a mutual fund or ETFs. It's just for certain accounts, some people prefer it one way, others prefer the other way. And then there's no right or wrong answer. But what we try to do is provide advisors uh, and, and obviously their clients with a choice. Then you decide which one you know makes more sense for you. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So um, uh, not huge advantages one way or another. In general, some, some there may be some advantages on a on a client by client and account by account basis to prefer an, an ETF, an exchange traded fund versus a mutual fund. But in any case, at least we've got more choices now um, exactly. within the dimensional uh, portfolio, within the, the dimensional world that we can choose when we're helping our clients really streamline their portfolios and streamline their approach uh, to their investing. So that's yeah. So that's important. Um, yeah, and, and I have to say that so many folks are focusing on the technical aspects of the ETFs versus, well, ETFs trade throughout the day, so you can you know have a certain price at 9.30 a.m. and another one at 4 p.m., whereas mutual funds only have one price at the end of the day. If, if you're going to hold these for 20 years, what difference does it make? You bought it at right. 10 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It doesn't make any difference. Right. A lot of these technical things that supposedly are, are differences for a long-term investor, they just simply don't matter. Costs are yep. the same. It just the, the only thing that matters in my view and the difference between ETFs uh, and, uh, and mutual funds is simply around when do you want to pay the taxes along the way or push everything back to the end? Yep, yep. Well, we don't, we don't have any questions. So I have, a, I have another question topic that I want to quickly talk about. We're, we're getting close to our time, but I wanted to ask about um, ESG and in particular yeah. sustainability. You know, here in Vermont, about 60% of our clients or our portfolio is probably pushing 70% these days. I've got to, I've got to take a look, are invested in the, in the sustainability funds and have a, uh, an ESG preference in their, in their thinking about their investing. Um, what can you tell us about, about um, Dimensional's approach to ESG um, and specifically maybe the, the sustainability funds? Yeah. And by the way, that could be a whole hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of, like, Sorry to save it for the last. Yep. Um, you know, our, our view on, on sustainability, I mean, first of all, ESG as a whole, uh, it, it stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's, it, it, it kind of, it's a, it's a catch all term that that uh, reflects a few things in there. Uh, environmental is obviously the one that a lot of folks are, are, are very interested in. And as you said, that pain, t- t- that, that, that uh, touches on sustainability. Uh, mm-hmm. Social, it has to do much more with preferences around social things. Uh, and it could be, you know, the type of uh, uh, companies and, and there are some preferences on social based on religious beliefs, based on, you know, other beliefs that somebody might have. Uh, and there is a governance piece which is around, you know, once you own that, that, that company and you are part of that ownership structure, what are you doing to actually help it uh, become better governed in, in many ways? So uh, what we've done at Dimensional is really try to uh, separate and say governance. And in terms of helping companies uh, be governed better, uh, it is not something that is done in one fund or two funds. It's across the board. And yeah. we're talking about executive compensation. We're talking about poison pills, anything that the management would would do uh, to detract from shareholder value, that's part of the governance that we are entrusted on behalf of investors to do. So it applies to every fund. So governance, the G <laughs> in ESG is something that we apply across every single fund. Nice. Uh, uh, social, uh, there is a set of social funds, uh, social responsible investing, also known as SRI, which is not sustainability. It's just really based on, you know, we don't want any, uh, um, any ammunition manufacturers. We don't want any tobacco. There are different preferences that, that folks have. And there is a set of funds uh, covering U.S., international developed and emerging markets um, that, that really uh, uh, start with the 
same investment philosophy that we have. Uh, we still want to be diversified across the different dimensions of the market. But on top of that, we put an overlay uh, on, on social responsible investing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, another class of funds. They're called sustainability funds, uh, mm -hmm. which kind of do the same thing. They're, they're really, it starts with the investment principles, make sure that, that, that we deliver on the investment. Uh, but then on top of that, we want to address that preference that people have uh, on sustainability, but try to do it in a way that, that is a lot smarter and a lot more robust. And again, we can talk for a long time, but what I can tell you is that what we do in that is we have created a proprietary scoring system. If you look at the environmental ratings out there, they're for each company, they're all over the place. Nothing right. is really standardized. So what we've tried to do is work with a lot of uh, very reputable uh, uh, environmental organizations and, and create a proprietary score. And what we do with that score is that if a company has a really bad score, so really not doing well on the environmental side, uh, we either don't hold that company at all, or we hold it in a much lower percentage uh, than it would have been in regular fund mm -hmm. uh, and and you know vice versa for companies that are sustainable we might overweight them uh, mm -hmm. and everything that we do in terms of the score is really around uh, climate change and, yes, and yes. particularly greenhouse gases that's a big focus uh, yeah. and what we try to do is be very um, not just uh, uh, just to do it but make sure that whatever we do has an impact so in that respect we actually do measure uh, the impact that the funds have uh, on um, on a uh, on, on different uh, uh, aspects, particularly when you look at greenhouse gas emissions. So in that respect, if you look at um, a, a broad market index, which is uh, 3,000 companies in the Russell 3000, and you look at oh, the, yeah. the tons of CO2 and say, well, if you bought that market portfolio, if you bought an index fund, um, that's those are the emissions that, that it would generate, uh, the intensity. Uh, in, in, a, in a fund that, that covers uh, uh, broadly the U.S. market, uh, we can actually cut that by a lot uh, wow. into these uh, into the dimensional portfolio. See, there is a measurable uh, um, aspect to, hey, what are the results? Uh, and it's not just the greenhouse gas emissions that are being emitted right there, uh, right now, but it's also the what we call the potential emissions from reserves. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and if you look at, again, the Russell, and you look at the uh, the megatons of CO2, they would be in, the, uh, in a typical market portfolio. What we try to do is really significantly reduce that. And in our case, wow. it's pretty much zero. So we, we reduce not only the current uh, gas emissions, but also uh, the potentials from, uh, from, from future. So I think that, that I, you know, I'm not really doing it justice right now because we don't have enough time. But if, if anybody has, if there's an interest for this, we can certainly do a, um, a webinar, talk a little bit more about how do you uh, basically align not just an investment approach, but you align it with a preference uh, to make sure that, that, that you deliver on both. Uh, and we try to do without, con I mean, like you look at the back in the day, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And, and, and when we started this, the issue was that, you know, there are not, it was, it was very concentrated. Uh, mm -hmm. The returns were not good, very expensive. So there are a lot of trade-offs that, that investors had to make to get this environmental exposure. But now we really, you know, we've been been doing this for you know almost more than 10 years and by now we have a really good sense of, of how to do it uh while still preserving the investment uh, uh philosophy and the last thing i'll tell you is that yeah. it's not just um it is not just uh, uh um uh, just just doing a fund but as a firm we believe in this i mean that we actually are, are net uh net zero um uh carbon neutral and we we've done this through engagement with some of these uh organizations around the world so it's not just creating a fund and putting out it but actually we live this as organization but we can talk a lot more um and uh and I, i'd be happy to 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 uh, you know go further on this but but i do think it's important to know that we're trying to do it in a very different way uh, and in a way that, that preserves the investment integrity uh, and the way that we implement sustainability is smarter. We, we're not really um, getting to that point where you concentrate so much or, or you just lose sight of the fact that even within the center industry, there are some players who are really good about uh, uh, being greener than others. So you got to pay attention mm -hmm. to all of this. It's true, and we really appreciate. Obviously, it's uh, the the sustainability funds make up the core of our portfolio for our clients, and it's aligned with our overall evidence based philosophy. So yeah. we really appreciate the fact that Dimensional has gone down this path and provides us with solutions for our clients that can help 
address these issues and 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 that you provide demonstrable evidence of the impact of of investing this way in a in a tangible way that clients can appreciate when we look at the that reduction in in uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gases and um, and reserves that's that's that makes a big difference so thank you well Apollo thank you so much for for your time this afternoon I'll let you get back I know you've got a busy schedule you're probably on to another group somewhere <laughs> else in the country thank you so much we really appreciate um, your support and the support of dimensional funds um, uh, for us over time uh, you guys give us the tools and get up, give us the confidence that we can help our clients achieve their obje objectives and their goals long term so we feel blessed to be able to have you guys as, as a valuable partner. So thank you very much. And until next time, have a great afternoon. And, and I'm sure we'll see each other again uh, before time goes by too much I'll more.